Central Florida, seen and heard, rising water. You're listening to The Wrap from Central Florida Public Media. I'm Brendan Byrne. This week, the team of journalists at Central Florida Public Media are rolling out the second installment of our flagship series, Central Florida Seen and Heard, Rising Water, exploring the effects of water on Central Florida and urgent calls to address policy and other barriers to change as we prepare for a supercharged upcoming storm season. Today, we learn about flood maps, what they are used for in planning for the future of the region, and where they fall short. But those maps are not going to help us plan five, ten years or and longer down the, down the road. We need to be able to, to use the best science and the best predictions. And we'll visit a community that floods consistently, where we find the data engineers use to plan for storm water may be outdated due to climate change. Anything new that's going in nowadays will be experiencing the effects of climate change. And so there, that in and of itself, I think, would warrant using some type of future projection to at least account for it in some way. That's ahead on The Wrap, the big stories this week from Central Florida Public Media. But first, these headlines. A state task force is recommending a site near St. Augustine, not Eatonville, as the location for a proposed Florida Museum of Black History. Central Florida Public Media's Joe Burns has more. The Florida Museum of Black History Task Force voted 5-4 to four Tuesday to ratify its rankings from last month's meeting and select an undeveloped site near St. Augustine belonging to Florida Memorial University. St. John's County and Eatonville were close in those rankings, but the averages were skewed by one task force member, Republican State Representative Cayenne Michael of Jacksonville, who gave St. John's a perfect 110 and scored Eatonville 32 points lower. Michael defended her scoring at Tuesday's meeting. Never did I deliberately take any score to rise up another location. I took the information that was given me. Advocates for the Eatonville site, like Orange County Democratic State Representative Bruce Antone, touted the town's sustainability with tourism and local support and its ready-to-build location. Antone sponsored the bill creating the task force, but wasn't appointed to it. This was a huge decision for the state of Florida, a huge decision. And I knew we had one chance to get this right. And I think today we blew it. I know we blew it. He says the St. John's location lacks funding and has no sustainability or feasibility plan or assurance the land can be used for development. Joe Burns, Central Florida Public Media. The race to fill Orlando District 5 City Commission seat is heading to a runoff. Shaniqua Shan Rose and Traveris McCurdy were the top two candidates of the seven running for the vacant seat of suspended City Commissioner Regina Hill, with no candidates getting more than 50 percent of the vote. The runoff election is scheduled for June 18th. The winner will serve until Regina Hill's term expires in January 2026, unless she's cleared of the charges before then. Hill was indicted in late March on seven felonies, including exploitation of an elderly person and fraud. She has pleaded not guilty. The first launch of Boeing's Starliner capsule carrying astronauts has been postponed indefinitely. Teams at NASA and Boeing were planning a launch attempt Saturday, but an ongoing investigation into a helium leak has postponed that plan. It's unclear when the next launch attempt will occur. NASA says the flight team has been meeting for days assessing an issue related to a leak in the capsule's propulsion system, and there's still more work to be done. These stories and more on our website. Visit cfpublic.org. An above-average hurricane season is forecast, so we'll need to know what's coming and when to evacuate. But one leader in the immigrant community in Central Florida says something's missing, and we need to communicate better with non-English speakers. That is a common threat, really, when it comes to critical resources, life-saving resources, uh, and information that can literally mean somebody gets to live or die. The challenges of storm communication, that's on our website, cfpublic.org. Like many Central Florida communities, Seminole County is currently relying on flood maps from the Federal Emergency Management Agency that are almost 20 years old and don't fully account for all the flooding factors like stormwater infrastructure, climate change, and development. For Central Florida Public Media's special series, Central Florida Seen and Heard, Rising Water, this week, reporters Molly Durig and Lillian hernandez Carbajo explore why official FEMA flood maps don't show the full scope of flooding risk and how people in Seminole County are navigating the uncertainty. Today is business as usual at the Breezeway restaurant in historic downtown Sanford. 
but General Manager Luis Quinones remembers one day in 2021 when water came rushing into the restaurant's courtyard where people were dining. That one was really, really weird because there, that one actually wasn't a hurricane. That was just a normal storm. The video shows patrons trying to avoid the water, lifting their feet up on tables, mostly laughing it off. We're just hanging out, but that's what Sanford is. We're a very, very fun town. But next year, Hurricanes Ian and Nicole hit before an unnamed tropical storm, which Quinones says caused the most damage. After that, it wasn't so funny anymore. This is a very old building, so things like that do affect us big because when you have deterioration, when you have you know the flood coming through, we're losing equipment, we're losing furniture. It, it does a lot to it. Leaving staff at the Breezeway concerned about the future of their historic building and their business. The Breezeway is about a third of a mile south of Lake Monroe, which was flooded for months after Hurricane Ian hit. And yet, FEMA flood maps don't place the restaurant in a designated flood zone. Molly found out this isn't uncommon in the downtown Sanford area. Actually, according to Seminole County's stormwater master plan, most of the Sanford Basin is not in the 100-year floodplain. Breaking that down, a drainage basin is an area that collects, stores, and transports water. A 100-year floodplain is where flood risk is highest. We drove to Seminole County's Public Works office to meet with project manager Jeff Sloman. He told us the term 100-year flood is often misunderstood. What's called a 100-year flood is defined as a storm event that statistically has a 1% chance of occurring every year. It's not a storm that occurs every 100 years. Sloman says in reality, those kinds of storms are happening more often, including here in Seminole. Since 2011, total rainfall in the county has gone up by nearly 150%. The last time FEMA updated Seminole County's flood map was almost 20 years ago. And Sloman says the 100-year floodplain looks a lot bigger now than it did back then, meaning those high-risk flood zones on the maps should be covering a lot more area. To fix this, Sloman says for the first time, Seminole County is running new studies on almost all of its water basins at once. Basin studies evaluate how much water flows to a certain point, usually a water body like Lake Monroe, before flooding happens. FEMA actually does the actual revision of the floodplain, but it's all based on documentation that the county provides to them. So what's the problem with updating the maps? Well, Sloman says after all the local funding, manpower, and resources for the basin studies, then it goes to FEMA. It is a very long process with FEMA. It takes probably over a year from your initial submittal till the maps are actually issued. Like many parts of Central Florida, Seminoles developed a lot since 2007 when the last flood maps were made. As we lay down more cement, the water has fewer places to go. That's something Lily can tell us all about. She's been doing research on the impacts of development on water flow. And I found it's not just development. There's also the compounding factor of rising water levels and stronger storms from climate change. Not to use a metaphor that might be particularly apt for Florida, but it does seem like there's almost a perfect storm of pressures going on here. That's Environmental Protection Agency Deputy Administrator Janet McCabe. We met her earlier this spring when McCabe visited Central Florida. McCabe says it's time to stop living in the past and address the country's current and future water management challenges. Things are enshrined in policy and regulation and in people's brains, well, this is how we do it, and this is what the maps are, so just use those maps. But those maps are not going to help us plan five, ten years or, and longer down the, down the road. We need to be able to, to use the best science and the best predictions. There's actually some talk of changing FEMA's current flood mapping strategies altogether. Right now, flood maps are more of a snapshot in time designed to show the highest risk areas for flood insurance. That's key. Think of FEMA flood maps as flood insurance rate maps or firms. Flood insurance is required for buildings in the most flood-prone areas, but in reality, government officials told us they recommend it for pretty much everyone in Florida. That's what Sanford's Public Works Manager Mike Cash told Molly. If you're not in the floodplain and you think there's any chance in the world that your house might flood, you better carry flood insurance. That's why seven years ago, Cash says he got the city of Sanford involved with FEMA's Community Rating System, or CRS, a voluntary system that scores local governments based on what they do to reduce flood risk. In exchange, community members enjoy a discount on flood insurance. That's not a bad idea. Florida has one of the highest flood insurance rates in the nation. According to FEMA, flood insurance can range anywhere from about $500 to nearly $2,500 a year. Lake Monroe is the, is the main discharge point for everything downtown. Water from three different basins flows into Lake Monroe. 
But some of Sanford's stormwater pipes are more than 100 years old, and the city's rapid growth is overwhelming them. So Cash says the city is building out a whole new fourth drainage basin to help ease the load. It's a significant project, and we expect it to do a lot of good. Hopefully, this project will help businesses in downtown Sanford, like the Breezeway. But Cash says clear-cut solutions are hard to come by because flooding is hard to predict. It doesn't follow the rules, let's put it that way. Making the search for adaptable, comprehensive solutions just not that easy. Speaking of the Breezeway, (laughs) downtown Sanford's iconic comfort spot is home to many. I love, love this place. I honestly do. Uh, Mainly because everyone that seems to come here, it's almost like we're all family. Hey, Cindy. (laughs) Um, There you see what I mean? Everybody here knows everybody. While updating flood maps costs local governments time and money, ultimately, community members and businesses don't have time to wait. If we shut down, that's one thing I I try not to think about. Um, That's, uh, let's hope it never comes to that. For now, they're making the best of a bad situation they barely understand. But Quinona says they're ready. We have prepared, actually. So basically what's going to happen, we're going to have a hurricane party. We're going to hang out. We're going to drink and we're going to get through just like all the other years. (laughs) That's certainly one way to do it. Lilian Hernandez Caraballo and Molly Durig, Central Florida Public Media. Lilian Hernandez Caraballo is a Report for America Corps member. How many times can communities flood from severe weather before a lasting solution arrives? That's the question some are now asking as flooding continues to destroy infrastructure and municipalities to dedicate more money to flooding mitigation based on what some experts say is historical data, data that may not provide the needed protection moving forward. Joe Mario Pedersen continues our series reporting. Local flood mitigation systems are built based on an area's geography and storm frequency. The understanding was that you get 30 years of rainfall record, and that's sort of representative of what we assumed was a stationary or non-changing climate. That's Dr. Eben Bean of the University of Florida. Bean says this basis for creating a flood mitigation system is baked into regulations and state and federal codes. But these days, scientists say severe weather is becoming more frequent and some attribute it to climate change. But then as as climate started changing, it is something that is not necessarily incorporated into our current approach yet. Cue Cynthia Slater. Good evening. I'm Cynthia Slater, um, president of the NAACP but first, a lifelong resident of the city of Daytona Beach. It's October 2022, and Slater stands before the Daytona Beach City Council, a week after Hurricane Ian flooded her neighborhood. It was her fourth flood in 20 years. In front of the council, she lays out four pairs of wading boots. These are all of the boots that I had to purchase because of all of the flooding. I refuse to continue to invest in a home where as soon as it is repaired, Two months, one year, two years down the road, we're flooded again and again and again. Today, you can hardly tell Slater's home was damaged, but her retirement account shows the scars. After insurance and FEMA paid for damages, Slater dipped into her retirement account to cover a remaining $15,000. Slater thinks in total about half a million dollars has been put into the house after all four floods. With the money gone, she's left with a thought. If stronger storms are becoming more frequent, what is the city doing for better flood mitigation? The flood mitigation is the greatest issue of uh, my political life. That's Daytona Beach Mayor Derek Henry. He says before Ian, the city made retention ponds larger with improvements to drain infrastructures, but the storm was too powerful. Kelly Kibler is an environmental engineer at the University of Central Florida. She says most of us have probably heard terms like the 100-year flood. That's commonly thought to be a really severe storm that only happens once every 100 years. But as events become larger and larger, they tend to occur more and more infrequently. But what a 100-year flood actually means is that there's a 1% chance of a major storm or flooding any given year. Kibler says that while our current models and planning are built on historical data, there are now conversations happening around considering future forecasts that are more dire. This idea of using predictive modeling is still fairly new and hasn't been incorporated into policies. However, Eben Bean from UF says there's no future where forecast modeling isn't a part of flood mitigation systems. Anything new that's going in nowadays will be experiencing the effects of climate. And so there, that in and of itself, I think, uh, would uh, warrant using some type of future projection to at least um, account for it in some way. Ignoring it at this point is um, 
you know, it's not being based in reality. As for Cynthia, she remains concerned. 20 years from now, where will we be? How far under water will we be? Daytona Beach is undergoing a study by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to determine where more flood mitigation is needed. The study is expected to take two to three years. Joe Mario Pedersen, Central Florida Public Media. That's it for The Wrap this week. All the stories from our series, Central Florida Seen and Heard, Rising Water, can be found on our website, cfpublic.org, or get the podcast version wherever you get this podcast, which is produced by Central Florida Public Media, with assistance from News Director LaToya Dennis and Digital Director Ryan Ellison. I'm Brendan Byrne. This is The Wrap.